I'm going to talk more about the Middle East and North Africa, specifically what is called the Arab Spring. And my basic question will be, why has the Arab Spring become an Arab winter? On February the 11th, 2011, the day that President Hosni Mubarak, the president of Egypt, resigned, I received a euphoric, ecstatic email from a German colleague. He spoke in the most glowing terms of emancipation, the rise of liberty, the overthrow of repressive dictatorial regimes in the Middle East. I was more cautious. I said, I hoped he was right, but I don't think he was right. I noted that democracy is a very delicate plant. It requires very special conditions in which to develop. In the West, democracy grew out of a series of different events. I'll mention just a few. The Renaissance. Again, for the gentleman who just came in. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, a friend of mine from Egypt wrote to me on the 11th of February, 2011, the day that Hosni Mubarak resigned as president of Egypt. And he wrote in the most celebratory terms of emancipation, the rise of liberty, the overthrowing of repressive dictatorial regimes in the Middle East. I was more cautious than he was. I pointed out to him that democracy is a very delicate plant. It can grow only in certain environments. In the West, in order for democracy to grow, a number, a number of things needed to happen. The Renaissance, which brought back the knowledge of ancient Greek and Rome and basically shattered the monopoly of the church on knowledge. It needed a reformation because the reformation believed in the individual. Martin Luther said, every man is a church unto himself, as opposed to the Catholic church in which only the priest could tell you what's true. It's interesting, I just stopped because I have a memory. After Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, 1525 or so, the Catholic Church, for close to a century, made it a mortal sin, not just a small sin, but a mortal sin, to read the Bible by yourself. You needed to hear what the Bible said through the priest and through the church. So it required a renaissance and a reformation that fragmented the universal power of the church. It required wars, 
the hundred years more, the thirty years more that taught many Europeans that religion and politics were very difficult to mix together and it's best in order to prevent violence to keep the two as far apart as can be. It required an enlightenment that cast doubt on all beliefs, that spoke of science, that spoke of reason and logic rather than faith. Of course, it required the French Revolution, which broke the back of the monarchies, first France, then others, in Europe. It required a scientific revolution. Newton was not merely a mathematician. He explained the world in a way that did not need the Bible to make you understand it. And of course, there was an industrial revolution, and I'm really making it very small and short, that raised the standard of living of many European peoples so that they had the leisure to talk about politics and I could go on and on. The important point is that none of these things, I told my German colleagues, had happened in the Arab world. <coughs> After the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, movements toward democratization were common in East Europe, even in places around the Soviet Union like the Baltic States, etc., etc. Even <laughs> South America there were fewer dictatorships than ever. Sub-Saharan Africa showed signs of democratic growth in various places. Some people even claim that Southeast Asia was showing signs of democracy. In fact, one interesting statistic is that the Heritage House, one of the most important research institutes in the United States, which is very conservative, by the way, said that for the first time in human history, more countries were run by free and fair elections than those that were not. An enormous moment of growth. I mentioned all these places, East Europe, South America, Southeast Asia, etc. There was one place where nothing budged, and that was the Middle East. There were no democratic movements to speak of, maybe tiny groups, little in the way of science-based industrialization. Most countries remained unchanged in their authoritarian character. The states that had seen some industrialization, like the Emirates, Qatar, perhaps a bit so uh, Saudi Arabia, did so only because they had enormous reservoirs of oil and they could invite the best scientists and the best surgeons and the best architects to build this Disneyland in the desert that they have uh, uh, built. One does not have to make a very speculative guess 
that had Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Bahrain and Qatar not had oil, they would still be small, dusty, poor states, or less than states. Now, do not misunderstand me. I am not trying to say that Arab society is incapable of democratic movements. Muslim society, many of you may know this from Jewish studies, during the Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, was more tolerant toward Jews, toward others, than Christian Europe was. In fact, Jewish terminology about this era, roughly 1200 to the expulsion, is called the Golden Age. It is a period of Maimonides and many, many other great Jewish scholars. So when these mass demonstrations in 2011 brought an educated elite of young men into Tahrir Square in Cairo. There were virtually no women. I just need to say that. That's why I said men. It was not entirely unprecedented. There have always been strains within Islam that have been more liberal than others. There is nothing inherent that makes the Muslim world incapable of democratic tendencies, although there are very difficult obstacles to overcome. It is very important to note the places that these demonstrations took place. <coughs> Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, to some extent Iraq, Yemen, and Libya. Each of these were military dictatorships with a facade, an outside of westernization and modernization, but they were dictatorships nevertheless. Recall just for a moment that Mubarak, Hafez Assad, the father of Bashar Assad, Muammar Gaddafi, Ben Ali, etc., all came from the military and all rose to power in some form of military coup, military attack on the government. These authoritarian regimes fell because they were based on something very narrow, the power of the military and the power of the secret police. They did not have what political scientists call legitimacy. They did not have a sense on the part of the people that this was the justified government, the right government, the appropriate government. And my talk today will try to explain why this is so. Why were certain regimes viewed as legitimate and others not? Why did the Arab Spring take place here and not there? Remember, the Arab League has 24 members. The vast majority did not have an Arab Spring. This is not because the countries that were rich didn't have one, like Saudi Arabia. Jordan didn't have one. 
very poor. Morocco didn't have one, also very poor. It was not merely a question of repression. Saudi Arabia is, without doubt, the most religiously repressive country in the world. So these are not the reasons. Let us try to take three countries in which the Arab Spring did not happen. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Morocco. Jordan and Morocco have one thing in common. Both kings, Abdullah and Muhammad VI, claim direct descent from the Prophet Muhammad. Their role as heads of government are therefore sacred. One reads regularly in Jordan, for example, about demonstrations against the finance minister, the foreign minister. The king is not touched because the king has this halo of sacredness about him. Um, Saudi Arabia does the Saud, the House of Saud does not claim that it has ties, genealogical ties, uh, to the Prophet Muhammad, but it has something else that is at least as important. Saudi Arabia has Mecca and Medina, the two most holy spots in Islam, and millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people come to Mecca for the Hajj, the pilgrimage, uh, during their lifetime at least once. This gives the Saudis a certain degree of honor that you should not violate, certainly not violently. In the end, then, the Arab Spring was a movement related to the lack of legitimacy of repressive military regimes that ironically all call themselves republics. But in fact, these were countries based on force. When a country like Jordan or Morocco that has this legitimacy going back to Muhammad, it is not difficult, say, for the king of, of Morocco to co-opt different groups within the country, from social democrats to Islamists, because he, the king, is sacred. We were all enchanted when we watched on TV the hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating <coughs> in Tahrir Square in Cairo. But this was what I suggest we call the CNN effect or the Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera effect. Yeah. Hmm? More Al Jazeera. More Al Jazeera. Okay. CNN, Al Jazeera. Or Al Jazeera, CNN. It is. Who were the people that these Al Jazeera reporters spoke to? The CNN, which I watched more, the CNN people that uh, the, the journalist spoke to. They were people who spoke English which means they had some form of Western education. 
they felt strongly about liberal democracy and human rights. They were on social media, Facebook and Twitter. Indeed, the, the demonstrations were organized on Facebook. Everybody come to Tahrir Square at this and this time. At the height of the demonstrations, there were anywhere between half a million and a million people. Some people say more, some people say less. But this was not Egypt. Egypt is not young people in t-shirts and jeans with Twitter accounts. Egypt has roughly 90 million people, most of whom, apart from Cairo, Alexandria, who live on the Nile, many of them without electricity, access to clean water, many are illiterate, especially among women, they are deeply traditional and deeply religious. One fact, some 80% of Egyptians perform female circumcision. Do you understand what that means? Female circumcision. Issues for these people like freedom of speech, free press, women's rights, are certainly not high on their agenda of things that need to be done. The government in Cairo is very distant from them. The leaders of the local mosque more likely have more authority over them than does this distant government. So the young people in Tahrir Square could bring down a government, but they could not create a state. I wonder how many journalists went out of Cairo and Alexandria to see the millions living along the Nile and how they reacted to what was happening in Cairo. How many of them understood the power of the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, Egypt's strongest non-governmental agency, a, a organization, even though it had been banned since the 1950s. No, they spoke to other academics, other westernizers, and the result was a very skewed picture of what the Egyptian reality truly was. It is interesting that after the Soviet Union collapsed, much the same thing happened, not only in Moscow, but many other places. Western intellectuals met in the living room of Russian, Polish, etc., etc., intellectuals to talk about democracy that was coming. Neither of them knew very much or felt very much deep Russia, what was really happening in Russia. They spoke to their counterparts as if it's coming soon. It will all be Sweden soon. We are now on the verge. Francis Fukuyama, in this famous phrase, said, this is the end of history. 
because the West, liberalism, democracy, etc., has succeeded. They had very little sense of Russian culture that preferred a strong man as a leader rather than the messiness of democracy with its many parties. They did not sense, or they were fooled by the euphoria of the collapse, to believe that a country, here I'm talking about Russia specifically, that had no experience with democratic government ever. It had a czarist past, which changed into a Soviet past. The czar became a commissar. So without understanding that without a democratic experience, it is very difficult to develop an active, vibrant democracy that calls upon even in the Ukraine, the turn back to 19, was it 19 to 1923 or whatever, there was a semi-democracy operating. Uh, the same is true of Poland that had a democratic interlude, but Russia had none at all. It had very little of what social science call a civil society. That is, organizations that were neither the government nor the family. Things that were organized between organizations as different as charities to book clubs that were not based upon government control. <laughs> and then the truth appeared. It is very easy to criticize the United States here. Yeah. Simple, too simple. There was an election held in, in, Cairo, in, in Egypt the first elections in 5,000 years of Egyptian history, and the results were precisely what the Western journalists, etc., did not understand. Nearly, or 40 some odd percent, voted for the Muslim Brotherhood, and another 20 plus percent voted for an even more radical Salafist, jihadist, call it what you will, party called Nur, which means light. Together, it was close to 70 percent, perhaps a bit more, of the population. How many voted for? democracy, for liberal democracy, you can count them on the fingers of a couple of hands. This was a small minority. After all, if there was a civil society in Egypt, it was the Muslim Brotherhood, which operated charities, social work, educational networks, etc. I looked up and it was interesting to find that the leaders of many of the main professions, the legal profession, the medical profession, and others were led by Muslim Brotherhood uh, functionaries. Um, so, it is ironic and perhaps painful to say that these elections expressed the true will 
of the Egyptian people. And the true will of the Egyptian people was not in the liberal democratic direction. No wonder then that Western states did not quite know what to do. This was a free election that had elected a non-democratic leadership. What is one to do? Obama, clearly confused, said, let the results of the election stand. But that is uh, like the uh, political scientist said, one man, one vote, one time. That was more or less uh, the, the reality. Now, there was one other group that had a certain degree of legitimacy in Egyptian society, and that was the army. Beginning from the 19th century, Muhammad Ali tried to modernize Egypt by modernizing the army. And the army became much more than simply a fighting force. It was also a major economic concern. It employed thousands in various different kinds of interests, in different kinds of businesses. And what's more, the Egyptian army had one enormous piece of legitimacy. In 1973, the Yom Kippur War, as it's called in Israel, the Egyptian army had not won the war, certainly, but they held out against the Israeli onslaught, their crossing of the canal, their overrunning the Barlev line, they are getting fairly deep into the Sinai gave them a certain cachet or halo of having stood up to what was considered the invincible Israeli army. But back to the uh, Arab Spring that has become a bitter winter. The Arab Spring and what happened consequently represents a disintegration of the state system of the Middle East. The state system in the Middle East was created in a very usual common way that imperialistic powers created their states. World War II was ending. The Ottoman Empire, the sick man of Europe, was uh, disintegrating as well. And two major diplomats one English, whose name was Mark Sykes, a name that, historian, that no one but historians remember, and the other was a French diplomat, whose name was Francois Picot. Picot and um, uh, Sykes met together in 1916. There were a whole bunch of other meetings thereafter, but they are spoken of generically as the Sykes-Pico Agreement. In fact, what they did was to divide the Middle East into different spheres of influence. France got Libya, Lebanon, 
and Syria, England got Iraq and Palestine, the mandate of Palestine prior to Israel. As, a as opposed to the very famous <coughs> Versailles Treaty, and even the earlier treaty, Congress of Vienna, that we all know ended the Napoleonic era, sykes Pico will be known only or mainly uh, by historians. In this treaty, as I said, they divided countries according to uh, spheres of influence. In these treaties, local peoples took no part. No one who lived in the area was asked to join and to give their opinion. sykes Pico was also a secret agreement that only became known in very strange ways about a year later. Now, I want you to just to look at, no, let's go to the other one. To look at this map, what do you find about this mass, this map, that is interesting and unusual? Let's look at Iraq. Straight line border. They took a ruler and they simply drew a straight line. Who cared if there were Sunnis living on the same side of Shiites? Who cared what clans there were? Who cared what tribes, what geographic uh, considerations there were? The lines were straight. Jordan has similar kinds of lines. Uh, uh, Iraq, again, has the same kinds of lines. The, diff the line between Israel and the Sinai Desert is more or less a straight line as well. Now, if you look at northern Africa, it becomes even more dramatic. Look at Egypt. Looks like someone drew it with a, um, whatever they call those triangular things that they draw. The line between Libya and Egypt is straight. Algeria has a straight line too, as does Mauritania, as does Western Sahara. This is not a good map of Morocco because a true map of Morocco would be a series of triangles that look like a geometric toy. That's how sharp they drew the line. One anecdote, somewhere at the very north of the Golan Heights, there is a town called Rajar, which half of which is in Syria, and half of which is in Israel. And they have been fighting forever about where it goes. <clears throat> where did this argument derive from? They used a fat pencil. And the line of the pencil, of course, on the paper looks straight. But the width of well, an extra millimeter or two made for a hundred meters, say, and that divided a town in two and created today uh, fighting between them. There are many other places, by the way, I and mean, I think that should be a very interesting lesson for you. When you look around the world and see straight lines, you can bet most of the time that this is the product of 
uh, imperialism. There's one major exception, and that is the line between the United States and Canada, which runs straight, but which was agreed upon by both sides as valid. These young men, and they were both young, Sykes and Pico, never asked people in Syria or in Iraq and in other places what they wanted. They created countries that really had never existed as such beforehand. Syria was a creation so that most people in Syria, when asked to define who they were, were more likely to say, I belong to this clan or to that tribe, or I'm a Sunni, or I belong to this geographic note place, rather than saying that they were Syrians. One thing that may be said in favor of Saddam Hussein was that at least he kept all these peoples and groups together by violence, of course. But he did, he was like Tito and the Balkans. He held them together simply by strength, by ruse, by deception, by propaganda. Now, one interesting exclusion from all this, which again represents imperialistic uh, interests is the Kurds. The Kurds today are about 40 million people. They are, in fact, the largest stateless nation in the world. And many, many times they were promised that Kurdistan would become a country. After all, it has more or less of a contiguous, they have more or less of a continuous, they go from here through northern Syria, through uh, Iraq, and even into uh, parts of Afghanistan. But it was not in the imperialist interest for all kinds of geopolitical reasons to make them a state. Uh, this explains why today something similar happened in Lebanon. Lebanon is today, at least for the elites, French-speaking, because France was the country that was given. Libya is a different example. That was not created by Sykes and Pico. That took place 20 years later, perhaps, when the uh, Italians invaded Libya and divided it among them and redrew borders, etc. But in fact, once again, Libya is really not one country. It was held together by Muammar Gaddafi, of course. But here is Tripolitana, and here is Cyrenaica, and here is Fezzan. They're different countries. And even today, when Muammar Gaddafi is no longer there to be the conductor of the orchestra, there are, prop there are two parliaments, one in Benghazi, one in Tripoli. There are probably dozens of militias, fiefdoms, 
warlords who control different parts of the country. Libya, if it is a state at all, is a failed state. It is not a united, coherent state. All right. Today, five Arab countries, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Sudan, to some extent, do not function as coherent states. Coherent, I mean united people feeling that they are part of a certain state. Iraq, although it's improved since the Western invasions, is not a coherent nation state even though, I repeat, even though it has improved since Bush's ill-fated uh, 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 attack on Iraq, completely mistakenly because the terrorists of 9-11 did not come from Iraq, and I think we all know that story. Uh, what arises from all this for one observer, an amateur, not an Arabist, is that the idea that the West could impose from the outside, like Sykes-Picot, a state system on a very complex Middle East is an illusion, cannot be done. Four centuries earlier, after the Thirty Years' War, in 1648 in Westphalian, in today's Germany, the Catholics and Protestants came together and made the Treaty of Westphalia that in very general terms, set up what Europe would today be. Without Germany, without Italy, of course, but mainly set up the boundaries of the country. Sykes-Picot is an attempt to do the same from the outside for the entire Middle East, and it did not succeed. Let's give it credit where it's due. It lasted for nearly a hundred years until the Arab Spring. But when it was challenged by the Arab Spring and things began to come apart, it became clear how non-coherent, how artificial these states in fact were. And interestingly, adding to the problems, the English and the French gave power to the rich families, the families of the notables, the effendies, and did not consult with the people at large. It became clear that Syria, that Syria and Iraq created, perhaps not ex nihilo, perhaps not out of nothing, but they are created artificial states created by other powers and not things that grow up, evolved naturally over history to become certain countries. As I said and I repeat, the people's interests were more in being Sunni or Shiite, Kurds or Christians, member of other ethnic groups, clans or tribes, linguistic groupings, geographic communities, for whom formal artificial borders meant very little. Usually, Tunisia is cited 
as the, exception, as the exception to the rule. After all, power has been transferred in Tunisia without violence. But Tunisia is a very exceptional case. Tunisia is a very small country, has a homogeneous population, and has no enemies around it. Pointing to another place where I think that democracy has succeeded a lot more is the Kurds in northern Iraq. The Kurds in northern Iraq have created what is, for all practical purpose, an almost state. Interestingly, they have consulates all over the world. They don't have embassies. Because embassies means your state. Consulate means you're taking care of local issues. Kur Kurdistan, this northern Kurdish area, has no Iraqi soldiers in it. They tried, but they're not there. This may be a bit are at the border, but they really, they really haven't moved. And the, the Kurds started to be a little bit too uh, ambitious, and the Iraqis stopped them. Young Kurds do not speak Arabic. They speak only Kurdish. On the other hand, going across the border, Iraq suffers from profound ethnic fragmentation between the Sunni minority and the Shiite majority, and of course, the great shadow of Iran the great Shiite power uh, cannot be forgotten. Uh, Egypt does not fall into the category of the other states. And this is clearly because Egypt is and has been for 5,000 years a coherent state. Long before the seventh century, when the Muslims came and conquered, the Egyptians had their own civilizations going back to the pyramids perhaps 5,000 years ago. They had a pharaohic past. They had a sense of identity, authentic identity, that means that it remains a coherent state. It's really interesting, as much as I despise ISIS, uh, the Daesh, the Islamic State, that ISIS understood right from the start that the Middle East of Sykes-Picot was an illusion. And they understood that it was not legitimate and that the true uniting force of the true uniting force of the Middle East was, of course, Islam. And the caliphate, the return of the caliphate was a way to do away with Sykes Pico, with the imperialist division. Of, um, of the Middle East. It seeks to erase the borders between Arab countries and revert to an all-Islamic government, which is without doubt for them legitimate. Syria, even today when Syria Bashar Assad's Syria is controlling more and more of the country, mostly Damascus, and mostly Damascus. It is not, in fact, 
controlling most of Syria. It's not. Most of the places are too distant. They're controlled by Russians and Iranians. Yeah, that's who's controlled. What? Russians and Iranians are controlled. Ru Russians and they, in, Syria is not returning to 2010. It is no law, it is not creating a coherent state once again. There are different powers, different fiefdoms, different militias, different groups all over the place. Why? Because Syria is not a coherent state and never was. It was created by fiat, by diktat, and very few people felt above all that they were um, um, that they were uh, Syrians. Today, As Assad controls Damascus and much of the coast, but then there are the Druze, and then there are the Kurds, and then there are the secular oppositions, and then there are the S Soviet, I'm sorry, Russian spheres, and until now, and Trump's latest insanity, also an American uh, area. Hezbollah is fighting a proxy war for Iran. Iran has its Republican guards there. So don't let anyone tell you that Syria is a normal state, once again coming to where it was in 2010. It's easy, of course, to criticize Obama for not stepping in at certain times. But as one American put it, American diplomat put it, Syria is a country of bad options. Almost anything that would be done or could be done when everyone was fighting against everyone and it was difficult to find someone who had not been fighting against the other one before, etc. It's very difficult to step into such a reality and to make Syria whole again. To imagine that Syria will once again become a cohesive nation state within its own borders, is probably out of the question. Sykes Pico has unraveled. The same is true of Libya. I showed that a moment ago on the board. It was basically the invasion by Italy that split up, that made the country at least three parts into three different areas, and only Gaddafi could hold it together for as long as he lived and died. The one really interesting uh, consequence of all this is that of all these countries in the Champs, in the area uh, to the east, there is one, now I'm not talking about Iran or Afghanistan, but in the Arab there is one people that has remarkably created a nation, and that is the Palestinians. The Palestinians did not exist as such prior to the Second World War. By all accounts, Yasser Arafat, then a student studying engineering, he once said when they were building a dam, and they had to give a lot of money for it. He said, Anna Mohandas, I'm an engineer, let me do it. But in any event, he was studying engineering in Cairo and set up a group called Palestine Liberation Organization. This is in the mid 50s. And today, the Palestinians have strong sense 
of national coherence, even though they don't have the long history of all the others, and that is because they have been involved in war after war with Israel that has made them more and more um, uh, united. It is therefore important to understand that liberal democracy and its growth are slow, unstable, and certainly not a linear process. Take France, for example. From 1789, when the French Revolution took place, until de Gaulle took power in the Fifth Republic in 1958, France was not a stable country. It went from one side to the other side. I don't have to go through French history, Charles X, uh, the Paris Commune, etc., etc. I will only mention one thing, that from 1945 until 1958, France had no fewer than 25 governments. In other words, a stable, strong democracy did not take place until roughly 150 years after uh, the revolution. I want to add one last point. I'm coming close to conclusion. In the West, it is normally thought that secularization is the sparrow that says spring is coming. People become secularized, liberal democracy tends to grow. That is the general rule. It may not be exactly true all the time, but, but secularization generally goes hand in hand with, uh, um, uh, with democracy. There are examples, counterexamples. Singapore, an authoritarian state that is nevertheless democratic. India, a poor country that is nevertheless democratic in its way. So it's not a general rule, but as a uh, rule of thumb, secularism leads to liberal democracy. But if one looks more closely at the Middle East, Modernization, secularization were not a groundswell from below. There were no movements en masse from below to create secularized Western modernistic politics. Rather, Secularization came almost invariably from above with secularizing elites, usually in the army. Examples are very easy. The Shah in Iran tried westernization and Khomeini came instead. Um, Ataturk tried it in the most revolutionary way and we know where Erdogan is going today. Nasser himself brought a certain degree of westernization in terms of military equipment, etc. Hafez al-Assad was a pilot of a fighter pilot, was a fighter pilot, and he too brought technology, etc. But it was from above, and it pressed below. On whom did it press? It pressed on religious, traditional peoples who had very little interest in Western values. So that while in the West, 
secularization is, as I said, the sparrow, the little bird that says spring is around the corner. In the Middle East, secularization was almost always repression. It was from above to below. Uh, and it happened rather quickly that these repressed feelings, let's call them pre-modern even, traditionalist, Salafist, jihadist, etc., when the top veneer of westernization was broken away, return back to the uh, uh, traditional uh, religious way of life. What I'm trying to argue is that the Middle East cannot be dealt with ahistorically, which is, I fear, what most Western analysts Thinking in Western terms often, not always, there are some experts who know better, but their voice is generally drowned out. Uh, mostly they think in Western terms and have very little empathy or understanding of the deep Arab world, which is something very different from meeting in someone's castle, sitting across the table and drinking kawa and saying hello and everything will be okay. There is no fix to the Middle East that the Westerners can bring. A Western fix will be, if it takes place, a kind of 21st century Sykes-Pico. Unless internally some real change takes place, America doesn't have the key. Iran doesn't have the key. The Russians don't have a key. What can be said, I think, is that the past will not be like the future. A cliche, obviously. The past will not be like the future. And it will require the growth of local endemic forces, together perhaps with external uh, encouragement to change the Middle East. If I were forced to make a prognostication, to tell the future, let me stop parenthetically and say, the Talmud says that after the destruction of the temple, prophecy was given to idiots and children. And since I don't count myself in either of those categories, uh, I will not prophesize, but I will say what seems to me to be the trajectory that is moving into force today. There will be a long period of tra transition. It will not be quick. It may well stabilize into something that we cannot see today. But one thing I think is fairly certain. The map of the Middle East is very unlikely to return to the state system that appeared quite permanent a mere nine years ago. Thank you. Right. Please. <laughs> I just want everyone to understand 
that I feel a little bit uh, out of my league here. I am a, a, a resident of the Middle East. I read about it. I've read its history. I think I understand more than many other people, though, but I am not an Arabist. I do not speak Arabic. Here we have an Arabist, and I would very much appreciate his take on my thesis, on my ideas. Yeah, I would say that generally I would subscribe to the main thrust of what you said, uh, but I will add some, some provocative details maybe, which... And maybe they against. will respond to you too. Yeah, they, they will go against, uh, uh, they will change the picture. Uh, when you say that the Middle has been rectangular and triangular, that's quite obvious, of course. And such people, of course, uh, might not be known outside of the Middle East, but for anyone involved, you know, they are, they are the stable names, you know, and everyone mentions them, all the Arabs know these names, most of them, at least, whoever pretend to be ever, uh, Arab uh, of Kafin, which is intellectual, roughly speaking, they all know such people, uh, and, and they all complain, of course. But ever since that's my caveat, basically, that's ever since this whole process started, which, as you correctly mentioned, it was early on in the last century, it took a lot of time, you know, to end the countries. So appearing into being were, uh, yes, you said, they were sort of imposed, but not, not truly fully imposed, because there was a process going on between the Arab, give and take, between the Arab elites and those who, and, and the guys like Sans Picot, like Lawrence, uh, the yeah. Arabian, you know, right. the famous British spy who, <laughs> yes. who, who did a very important, made a very important contribution into the onset of this process. Right. And there was a lot of, a lot of direct communication, particularly at the level of the elites. Those guys who claim their legitimacy as descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, etc., the Hashimit uh, house who are now ruling Jordan, you know, etc. And some of them ruled also Syria and Iraq in the old days. Uh, there was a communication, and the Brits were very realistic, which, which is a characteristic feature of the whole Saxon Anglo-Saxon culture. And believe you know, they were realistic. They only dealt with people who really had some power, and those were the heads of tribes. Yeah, the the heads of, and so on. Yes, they were the heads. Uh, they were also the heads of tribes, etc., or the rulers with the legitimacy uh, religiously sanctioned, as you just like place to say. Uh, so there was a communication. There were, there were attempts by these guys to sit on the table, on the round table with the Europeans, and they very often were denied this chance in the of negotiations. Course. But there was a, a second track diplomacy going on. Mm, so track B. Yeah, track B diplomacy, yeah. It was there always, you know, so that it's not like that, not that, amount, that, that much in artificial. So, uh, there was some reality behind that, some, some social, sociological reality. Uh, that's one point. The other point is that once already the, what basically was the, the Middle East was constructed largely on uh, the territory of the former Ottoman Empire, which collapsed. Okay, when it came up, like that, there was a lot of enthusiasm, local enthusiasm. There was a lot of Arab nationalism yes. everywhere, particularly in areas which are now bordering on Israel, you know, very booming nationalism. And uh, the national building process was set off. Mm -hmm. Artificial or not, all these constructs are, they are artificial to varying degrees, not equally. Mm -hmm. Some of them are more, yes, when yes. more deep, uh, deeply into the nation building, some less. And when Arabs travel nowadays across, uh, they are not treated by other Arabs as Sunnis or Shias or um, Alawites or whatever. Very often, the other party, a Saudi, would not know who exactly the Syrian guy is, mm -hmm. which community he belongs to. He will treat him as a Syrian. Mm -hmm. So externally, this truly works. Yes. Know? And internally to a large degree, okay. because all the authoritarian governments of these places, uh, barbarian as they might look quite often to the external observer, they invested heavily and deliberately into the nation building. 
Yes. And they did succeed to a very, very, very substantial degree. With that in mind, you know, every single subject of this education, which was going on, much, much like what you have been talking about in Israel, you know, the Arabization or Iraqization or Syrianization was going on everywhere, you know. But by the same token, all these guys, you know, they, they pretty much were of the size of the background, they pretty much are happy about that, and there were counter currents always. There were two currents simultaneously and dialectically working against each other okay. and producing very bizarre mixes sometimes, yes. you know, which were the, um, the one which sort of unified and very much Islamist one, <laughs> which is pro-caliphate, because this notion of caliphate was always there. Yes. It is a religious concept which was always right. there, which the Islamic State exploited very, very successfully, but it was not invented by them. Um, against this backdrop, I should say that the identities, the political nations of the Arab world do have some value and continue to have some value. Some of them, like you said, the five countries that you mentioned, maybe they will blot it out. This is a very, very much an open perspective. You know? well, Yemen doesn't yes. exist. In Syria, Syria is ruled right now by, uh, it, it was in the hands of clans a long time ago in history, and it was ruled by a very barbarian dictatorship for a substantial amount of time after a series of assassinations, you know, and collapses and coup d'etats, which multiple ones. Syria is an outstanding country for the number of coup d'etats, which led to the establishment, the establishment of Assad's uh, right. regime. And then, uh, if you look at Syria nowadays, it is truly ruled by uh, paramilitaries and militaries, official or semi-official, Hezbollah among them, one of the most outstanding examples, but there are lesser ones and stronger ones, yeah. and they either indirectly report to Russians or to Iranians. But you would agree and Assad regime that? is, is non-existent. Where, where, where it is a, a, a myth that uh, Syria is becoming unified, right. and they draw maps like the blue color moves here, and the red color reduces, you know. Yeah. This is all made up, right. because the blue color moves nowhere. The blue color only indicates which parts are more in control, more controlled by Iranian militias and Russian, Russian troops and militias. So, so and what you're saying not. fundamentally is, yeah. uh, what I said toward the end, that to think of Syria once again as a country that it was in 2010 is unthinkable. Yes, but one of the problems, a major problem, is that uh, most of the so-called international community continues to play by the book. I know, I know. There is another challenge because Syria is not only uh, Syria, there is another problem which is adjacent to it, which is Lebanon. Yeah. And according to the Israeli papers, the military papers and the uh, intelligence papers, which were made public since quite some time, Israel's position right now is not to see Lebanon as a state at all. Not to see the Lebanese government as anything but a proxy for Hezbollah. Which well, increasingly is truly the case. It is a trend. Yes, yeah. so this whole area right. is extremely, and then you, you take in the Turkish factor as well, because the Turks, of course, need uh, to protect their borders primarily. This is the major issue for them. And uh, this area is shrinking and also internally imploding. You know, this okay. is really a big problem. Yes. One more thing that I would add uh, to what you said about the legitimacy, you made a strong emphasis on this prophetic line, but this is only part of it, because we should broaden it. There is a Speaking of the legitimacy of some Arab regimes, like Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, the legitimacy, I would put it broadly, more is religious. These are religious narratives which sustain such a... Uh, this is only just one point in that, that some can claim, some cannot claim, because in Saudi Arabia, they have been successfully generating a very powerful discourse which sustains the religious uh, legitimacy of the regime, of the Saudi king. The Saudi king is... Uh, a person who is, uh, whose title is Khadim al Haramani Sharif. Actually, I met him. I shook, I shook his hand okay. recently. <laughs> recently, and everyone refers to him primarily, even in such person-to-person -person communication. Uh, of course, high-style communication, when the speeches are made and so forth, at the official receptions, they start from calling him Khadim al Haramani Sharif, which is the servant of two holy places. 
two holy places. Yes, this is very powerful idea, which mm -hmm. is totally homemade. Mm -hmm. It was work of a genius, you know, to, to come up with this idea. It's made out of almost nothing. With but the it works. With yes. the Almaha, the yes. Group. yes. And but then uh, uh, what else? Uh, the illegitimacy is also grounded on something else in the Arab world. It is the notion of hacking the ruler. And the whole conceptual framework upon which their understanding of power is grounded. It is very diff different from the Western yes. one. And this is one point where the two worlds really go apart. I wanted to just uh, end with something of a, a comic note. Uh, you say an Arab can walk across the Arab world and they will look at him as whatever. I have a, a had, he passed away, a close, close friend of Israel who was the mayor of a large Arab town, very close friend, and uh, he said he went on the Hajj, on the trip, the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca. And when people saw him before he put on his white robe, they looked at him and said, 48, 1948, the Joe, one of those who remained in Israel, they somehow saw by his clothes and the way he looked. So they do nevertheless recognize different groups. Yes, you're right, yes. Yes, probably. It depends on the level of... Uh, but I, I really like that phrase. How about in Mishmona, 48? Yeah, Arabs really, you're right about that. Arabs really, when they meet anyone, they try to decipher the person. Yes. They really start reading the person and they start from linguistic analysis, like, for instance, myself, like, which part you come from, which part of Syria you come from, which part of America yeah. you come from, right. and then you have to go down to more specific details and this important points. Yeah, just if I, it's, it's late, so I will just say one last thing. I have a colleague, uh, uh, an Arab colleague, who did his doctoral thesis on the town in Israel, West Bank, split down the middle in 1948. It's called Barta. And he studied the Arabic that was spoken in Israeli Barta against the Arabic that was spoken in Palestinian. And it was remarkably different that in 50, 60 years, uh, Hebrew had simply infiltrated than half the words or Arabized forms of the Hebrew, etc. And when they came in 1967 and they spoke to each other, they wait. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Okay, well, many, many thanks. You've been a, a good audience, even if you have been a silent audience. Uh, in some ways, that's good, too. In Israel, when I have to talk, I don't only get questions, I get attacks. So in some ways, that's easier. In some ways, that's a lot harder. Uh, but it's been a pleasure being here with all of you, and perhaps another time. Thank you. Thank you.